A&E biography, or A&E's WWE biography, I guess I should say, the newest episode this past week, Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, and I tell you, again, I, I loved a lot of this because we got to see such such good footage, especially early. A lot of people don't know that he was someone in wrestling before Sergeant Slaughter. They don't know about beautiful Bobby Remus. And, you know, the training footage with Vern and his barn, I always get a kick out of. And I'm wondering, that was a tall barn. I'd like to have seen him when they were building that thing. They were way up there. But um, I really, I love working with Sarge. He's a great guy. Was always fun. Was a one of the best working big men in the business during his, you know, his era. And you know, when in the WWF, whether he was agent, commissioner, whatever, he could cut the promo. He knew how to get things over. He wasn't, you know, going to be an asshole or put his foot down about anything. And it's just fun to 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 be around, uh, you know, backstage and you know just hang out with. So, because again, uh, you know the uh, the common thread in a lot of these, any kind of biographical piece on any of the wrestlers is that most of them were fans as kids and they wanted to get they had an affinity for the business they wanted to get in it, and also it didn't hurt when a lot of them like. Sarge were big kids and, you know, played football or wrestled in high school. And we were talking about you and I, before we went on the air real briefly, that you never noticed he had a lazy eye. And truthfully, I didn't, you know, I, I saw it when you would sit and talk to him, you know, in his later years, but it wasn't like it was a pronounced thing or whatever, but I did not know that he had a nickname. Apparently, the kids picked on him, even though he's a big kid. When he wore his glasses, one lens was thicker than the other, and they called him Cyclops. And, you know, so you don't think of guys like Sergeant Slaughter being the the victims of schoolyard bullies, but it it, it happened, apparently. And he heard about... Vern Gagne's training camp. And, you know, of course, the story was told, had you, had you heard this before, that he got in a fight with Billy Robinson and Vern broke it up and, and offered him a spot to come back to the camp? I never before, and, and I hope it's true. I'm not doubting it. <laughs> I hope it's true. But I never before heard, as Sergeant Slaughter's wife put it, that he kicked the crap out of Billy Robinson in front of everyone. Well, you, you but it's, know, it's, but it, that that would be the all time whopper to make up. It's almost too outrageous to make up. Well, but the thing is, you know, Sarge didn't say it. His wife did, and his, his wife probably wasn't there in person. And I'm not trying to knock Sarge. I'm thinking probably that there was ten, tensions flared on both sides, and Robinson was neither trying to hurt him nor was Slaughter probably wanting to you know, commit mayhem, but, you know, the Vern got into it before it got ugly, I guess. It would be funny if all the guys that Billy Robinson roughed around all of a sudden start doing interviews saying, yeah, I kicked the crap out of Billy Robinson. <laughs> and then that becomes his reputation going forward. He got the shit kicked out of him by everybody. He's dead. There's no film. We can say what we want. Uh, but it seems like that would have gone around a little because the one time, right with Peter Maivia, but one that was in front that, of everyone, though. You know, well, but at the same time, the the, the it, it, at camp, there would have been some people at camp. But that's the thing. Who was in the camp? Because this is after Ric Flair, but Chris Taylor was in some of those videos, and obviously he never really developed as a pro wrestler the way they hoped, so maybe he was getting some extra training. But Steamboat was after Sergeant Slaughter, right? Yes. I'm not... Who else was... In that footage, well, it was Vern, it was Chris Taylor, it was Robinson. It was somewhere around 1973, though. So the point is, it 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 would have circulated. I bet at some point, of uh, somebody in the AWA would have told it, just because Robinson had tension with some people. But nevertheless, um, here I'm going to say this at the top of the program because it's a recurring theme. His his ex-wife, who now we find out at the 
into the program he's reunited with in, in their golden years. Uh, but they were apart for many years since the early 90s. She never liked it. She says, I never liked the business. I never wanted this. I never liked her attitude. And this whole goddamn, I'm usually sympathetic with every oh, come on. family member, except for who was the goddamn weirdo that, oh, that, uh, that Missy Matt, Beefcake. Well, no, no. The weirdo that Matt Bourne had hooked up with and oh, yeah. let him oh, fuck yeah. an OD or whatever. But the, Nurse Ratchet. Yes. <laughs> But normally I'm sympathetic to all the family members and, uh, but this fucking woman, I'd have, I'd about had enough of her lip about three quarters of the way through this fucking program. Oh, come because, on. No, because not only did she have a bossy attitude, but it, it, again, it was illustrated that when uh, I'm jumping ahead here, we'll go more chronologically, but at one point, Sarge is in the WWF and they go to the Poconos and I know where they're talking. They used to have wrestling at some of the resorts there every once in a while. And Sarge is working with the Iron Sheik and the wife who never goes and that takes the daughters who never go to wrestling and Sarge gets potatoed by the Sheik and busted open and he's bleeding, but they're now 40 years old. They're grown adults and these daughters are still crying about it. There's been a lot of... Uh, Bret Hart thought the Mongolian Stomper was killing his father when Stomper showed up at the house one day to get his check. Bret ran, ran and hid under the stairs. But they were children of wrestlers, and as they were smartened up to the business and grew up, th these girls were deeply affected by that, I don't think, by the incident as much, or maybe as more as by their mother's reaction to all this. You know, when well, well, when Sarge comes in and says, yeah, I'm going to turn heel and main event WrestleMania in front of 100,000 people at the L.A. Coliseum. Yeah, well, he believed it at least. She said, you're going to ruin our lives. It, I think she was a never liked the business to begin with and was informing their daughter's opinions on it. I never met this woman, obviously, because she never came to the fucking she he main evented WrestleMania. She didn't come and watch. Look, you have no idea what it's like to be both a wrestler's wife and a military man's wife. It's just double taxing on the person. Oh, now don't be a smart ass. Well, let me ask you this. The incident, as you talked about it earlier, because I hate to say I thought this. I love this documentary. I thought this was great. And I thought the family was wonderful. But when he talked about bleeding in that match with the Iron Sheik, how bad of a hard way would it have been to cause the amount of blood loss that they were talking about? Was it a hard way, or was Sarge wrestling as he would, I guess, before an average Poconos audience? I don't know. What, what, what do you Did mean? Sarge no, cut himself? Did Sarge do it intentionally? No, no, because it was a spot show at the Poconos. No. Not at that, at that period in time would they have... Now, Sheik may have been... Who knows? He may have been itchy to goddamn have some blood to get some heat to put up but uh, but no, it it was probably a hard way. But at the same time, it also probably wasn't a. It's forty years later. It wasn't a ludicrous amount. It wasn't like the alley fight match with fucking Patterson amount of blood or whatever the fuck. But the the daughters saw it, and you can tell the mother hated everything about wrestling. She wouldn't let him bring his fucking gimmicks in the house. He's living. She in, left in, him over the Iraqi sympathizer the, thing. Yes, and divorced him over the Iraqi angle. So I have no and, idea and how committed he was to all this. It makes me respect him so much more. Oh well, I'll tell you a couple of stories. But um, the the thing is, I was going to say is he's he still lives in Burlington, North Carolina. It's beautiful out there, the out in the woods in North Carolina, but home of. Burlington Industries, Burlington Coat Factory. You've heard of those people. Big textile area, but nevertheless. That's where it's from? Yeah. I thought it was from Burlington, Vermont. Nah, fuck Vermont. They know about coats. That's why I thought it was a coat factory. Oh, they know about textiles in the Carolinas. Um, but anyway, he's he's got a, you know, a regular nice house, but he's got no, none of his wrestling stuff in the house, I guess, because they're back together now. He's got tens of thousands of dollars of his original prize memorabilia and collectibles in tubs in a garage. 
So I just didn't like this woman. Love Sarge. Love Sarge. Didn't like this woman. It was nice to see, and I'm someone who collects Sergeant Slaughter figures. I love the fact that there are multiple kinds of figures across multiple toy lines in and out of wrestling. And he seemed to have everything. So here's someone who did save everything. Because I was looking at what he had there. It seemed like he kept at least one of everything. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's in tubs in his garage. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Vern got him booked in Vancouver, and that's when he became beautiful Bobby Remus, which if you go and see that, it's, it's ridiculous because he was not, he was, it, not only was he not beautiful, which that's part of the heat, the heavenly bodies or whatever, you know, but it just wasn't him. He was doing a superstar Billy Graham because that's when Graham was so over in the AWA, and it just didn't fit him. It wasn't his personality. and. Somebody had tweeted, well, so he was beautiful Bobby before Bobby Eaton. But just to clarify, the original beautiful Bobby was Bob Harmon, who was managed by the Grand Wizard in the WWWF and was also friends with Les Thatcher, and we brought him down to be a sports agent, Bob That's right. Harmon. That's right. To, <laughs> to represent Nature Boy Buddy Landell when he came back to Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Uh, but they had a lot of talking heads on on this show, and they should have because everybody liked Sarge. But Gerald Briscoe and Greg Gagne, DiBiase, Hulk Hogan, Mick Foley, Shawn Michaels, Ricky Steamboat, Bob Costas, Bret Hart, and of course, the reliable Bruce Pritchard, which we'll get to here shortly. How unbearable is he? No matter what he says, it comes across as disingenuous and slimy. Don't make me jump ahead chronologically. So. He sees Sergeant Slaughter, that is, he, too many pronouns, pal, sees the D.I., the movie with Jack Webb, and got the idea and put it together, and they had some of the early pictures and everything when he was working on the gimmick, and I did not know that he got the name Sergeant Slaughter from another movie that was a Jackie Gleason character. As much as I love Gleason, I never saw that fucking movie. So there's a bit of trivia for you. There were a lot of things in this documentary. Again, I don't want to jump too much all over the place, but just about talent he discovered. There were a lot of things that I discovered in terms of brought them to Vince's attention. Yeah. There were a lot of things about Sergeant Slaughter I never knew before that I learned from this. And, uh, it, it, you know, again, with his... I didn't his know that, own. but I just figured his name was Bob. You know, the early stuff you see with him, you know, Sergeant Bob Slaughter. Yeah. Okay, he took the name Slaughter. What sounds more, you know, punishing than that? But that's, uh, you know, it, but it, it's a, an example here of when guys used to have ideas for a gimmick and be able to take them to a territory and, and try it out because he pitched it to Vern, and Vern said, I love the idea. Go to Kansas City and do it. And that's what he did, and that was, and I didn't realize how long his break was uh, because obviously, you know, in those days, I'm there's no home video, but I'm keeping up with like the the bulletins of the time that had the newspaper ads, and you see guys' names and etc. Um, and then the early newsletters and good old Terry Justice and his bulletins, you knew that um, there was a guy by that name in a territory or whatever, and then. What I didn't know was that his mother got cancer, and that's why he went back home to Minnesota and ran his father's company, and he was off wrestling for probably, what, about a couple of years, maybe? I'm not exactly sure how long, but this is when, and you know, you never really think about the timeline, he had already come up with Sergeant Slaughter. He was already doing an early version of that, and then he went back to Minnesota to be with his family, and then... Vern got him into the AWA, and that's when he became Super Destroyer Mark II, managed by Lord Alfred Hayes. Yeah, and and that's the thing that Sergeant Slaughter, he had done it in Kansas City, and Vern liked the gimmick, but he'd already had Super Destroyer, who was Don Jardine, right? That incarnation. Um, Scott Irwin. No, it wasn't Scott Irwin then, was it? It was, it was Jardine, because this was 1977 or 78. That was... I'll look this up. Check it up, but I, I, Jardine, that was Jardine's last run, was it not? 
as, as either a spoiler or super destroyer. He had done both depending on the territory. Remember, he was super destroyer in the Carolinas. Or am I, do I have a brain tumor? I wouldn't call it that, but uh, I don't know what you have, but uh, maybe right that it wasn't Scott Irwin. Because Super Destroyer was Scott Irwin in Georgia. That's right. In the early 80s. But the point is they had an established guy in the territory in the AWA called the Super Destroyer under a mask. And whoever it was, we'll find out in a minute, Vern got sideways with him and... He was gone, and Vern needed a replacement. So rather than bring in a new gimmick to get over from scratch, he brought in another guy to put under an established gimmick and give him to the same manager, Lord Al Hayes. And that way, with with Sarge wrestling in the AWA and Vern having a plane, he could get him home every night, and they only worked 15 days a month, and he was able to spend time with his mom and He'd, and uh, oh, and he told about the touching goodbye and et cetera. So that was that period of time where he stopped being Sergeant Slaughter just to go home. And but that's how much you know. Uh, Vern was a big promoter at that time, and to put him in a top spot after just a couple of years in the business, that's how much they thought of his work at that point in time. Have we solved the Jardine mystery? Yeah, we have. It was Don Jardine. I have a little bit here from kfabememories.com. Of course, kfabe Memories is a part of Arcadian Vanguard. This is from their AWA history, page uh, 23, or number 23, page 2. By the way, this all soon be in book form, but anyway. The next goal for the Crusher was to unmask the Super Destroyer. Don Jardine had a disagreement behind the scenes with the AWA hierarchy about losing his mask and left the territory. The AWA announced on television that Crusher had unmasked the Super Destroyer on March 25th, 1978, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and then... And, and by the way, you know why? That Because Jardine had lost the mask early in his career when he first started being the spoiler, and it had killed whatever run he had going on, I can't remember what territory he was in, and Gary Hart, who managed him, told it, don't don't ever lose the mask again. Remember, too, he had problems with uh, the Garden, because you couldn't have masked wrestlers on there until, what, 73? Yeah. So, but anyway, after Don Jardine abruptly left, Bob Remus came back to the AWA under a mask billed as the Super Destroyer Mark II one week after Jardine left. <laughs> Remus was a graduate of Vern Gagne's training camp in 1974 and had been on the AWA undercard in 74 and 75. So uh, while he was doing that, Pat Patterson was one of the top guys in the AWA in the ring still. This was when Pat was, you know, in the process of, of going to the WWWF first as a wrestler and then transitioning to announcing and working in the office or whatever, but he had told Pat about the Sergeant Slaughter gimmick and Pat took the pictures to Vince Sr. And of course they loved it. And they brought him the first time to the WWF where he got over, you know, fairly quickly, uh, as, as, as a top heel. And, you know, again, that's where he really wanted to stay for most of the rest of his career because he always got over in that territory and in that environment. And as we'll, we'll see in a minute, you know, he had to take the break from Vince for a while because he was making money, but the alley fight that they had the the highlights of, and they have to they have to turn the chroma down on the color when they have blood now, I guess on on uh, a and e. Uh, but that match, think about this. It was at the time, and I have a real time reaction to it because we were we were hearing about things. This was when I was a fan and I've told you the stories about going over to Weasel Dooley's in New Albany when he had early cable before Louisville got it and, you know, watching a couple of the Madison Square Garden shows. And we were like, well, fuck, because they weren't as good as the average show on Tuesday night in Louisville. And that was the style up there in New York at the time. They had great talent, but they had hard rings and they had short matches and they, they sold the sizzle, not steak, whatever simile you want to draw so we started i started driving the 40 mile round trip or whatever on saturdays to see the georgia show on tbs but it, it still when 
that alley fight match happened, it was so different. It was sought after with the VHS tape traders. It was completely different than the normal WWF style matches. It was like San Francisco meets the AWA and two of the best workers. And just the, you know, it could have been on an NWA program. And that was at the time it stood out and it really made Sarge a, 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 one of the darlings of the, the smart fan set as small as it was back in those days. But think about this. He trained in 73, 74 and turned pro, but then, and then took a, a period of time off. But by 79 or 80, he's one of the best working big men in the business. So is it four or five years full time? He's, he's on top in Madison square garden. He's fucking tearing the house down. And then I got to see him some also when he first went to the Mid-Atlantic and started working for Crockett. And he fit right in with all of those guys because he could go. But, uh, I, I mean, you obviously as a, even though you're, you are, are too young to have seen that or been around real time, that's probably one of the first things you were, your attention was called to when you started trading tapes, wasn't it? Was the alley fight? The alley fight, there were certain things in the early 80s that in the early to mid 90s had like a, a lore around it. Tiger Mask Dynamite Kid, there were certain matches there. The alley fight match. Uh, Tiger Mask Dynamite Kid in the Garden, just because you want to talk about things that stood out because it was so different than everything else they ever saw there. The crowd reactions to that made it. But the alley fight was incredible, and I liked it. Better than uh, the Sheik Slaughter one in 85 or 84, which was a boot camp match. That was the second yeah. big bloody uh, Slaughter one because the garden was lit better and Slaughter came to the ring wearing white. Even though he was a heel, he wore white. Looking now, he's like, okay, he knew he was about to yeah. do something. But it was a level of violence you never saw in WWF. And Pat was such a tremendous worker. And all the time he spent in San Francisco working with the best talent. And that's where he got his booking mind from, you know, Roy Shire. And, and Sarge was just, he was, he was mobile in those years. But, and that's the thing that, you know, they didn't show a lot of the mid Atlantic uh, Crockett clips and everything, but he was uh, the, the, the one thing that they, they did make mention of him getting over the team of him and Don Cronodal, but they, they skipped the Greensboro cage. I mean, a 16,000 plus seat sellout and enough uh, thousand people turned away to be able to get announced on radio. Don't go there and close the fucking interstate exit. Cause Starcade. And cause Starcade. And, you know, they skipped over that, but I know for the bigger picture. But they spent a lot of time on the, the, the Sergeant Slaughter limo, the camo limo. Do you know where that thing ended up? It may still be there. I don't know. I think you told me it was in the parking garage of Titan Tower. Titan Tower. I want to say it was sitting on a second floor in the in the garage because every time that I ever went to that uh, to the office, I would go in the entrance to the garage and you'd have to go around a couple of times to get to where we could park to go in the elevator easiest. And I would pass that thing. It had like four flat tires and it hadn't been washed in Good God, I don't know, this was 96, 97, 98, 99, however many years, it had a layer of filth on it, but it was cool as shit. And I couldn't believe they didn't do something. Maybe now they've taken it to their one of their many warehouses and caves and labyrinths and caverns that they store their things in around the the area. But then they they, they jumped into the, the Sheik and Sarge program and making him a baby face. And that worked, you know, incredibly well. We talk about Jimmy Snuka being the hottest baby face they had in the, what, right before Hulk Hogan, but Slaughter was right before him, right? That was, you know, it, it's it, even it, crazier. It was all at the same time. That's how hot things were. In early 84, right after Hulk Hogan won the title and he was the hottest thing in all of wrestling worldwide, you had. Sergeant Slaughter and the Sheik start up, which ends up being a multi-month major feud, putting Sergeant Slaughter in the talks. Is he the biggest star in the company? Even though Hogan had the title, there were talks. I mean, Slaughter was yeah. a big deal. 
At the same time, you have Snuka and Piper playing off the Snuka popularity of the year before with the best heel they had seen in forever. That lit things up. Hogan didn't have a feud. It was just Hulk Hogan coming to town against whatever heels there. Big John Studd, Nikolai Volkov, Iron Sheik. Didn't matter. There was no feud. It was just Hogan coming to town. That's how hot he was. He didn't need a program yet. And it plays into everything with Hasbro because it isn't just a wrestler got his own deal somewhere. It was one of the most popular wrestlers in the world who's up there with your champion who's been reliable and effective and all these things is trying to do something outside of Vince's outside of something Vince gets a cut of. Yeah. Because that was the, the thing Sarge was at that point, you could say uh, you could make a case. He was the, the most over baby face in the business and Hasbro wanted him for GI Joe. And Vince had the deal with LJN toys and that's where his wife says, well, I told him he could always be a wrestler. So he gave Vince his notice. And it was a good move. Yes, that it, it was it was a good move. Um, I'm glad she took credit for it. <laughs> but but that's the thing. He became for the next several years as part of G.I. Joe and wrestling, the huge merchandise, the TV commercials. He took Bob Costas to the Carnegie Deli in the fucking camouflage limo. And everybody knew who he was. And that, that's where he was showing he kept all his shit in the garage. I would have kept the wife in the garage because this stuff you is valuable. It. You know, the other thing oh. is he was so popular as they tried to do with Jimmy Snuka later, famously with Superfly C.V. Afi. <laughs> they just tried to replace him. And Corporal Kirshner ended up getting over with WWF fans briefly. It was a brief run. But that was a gimmick literally created just to... Sergeant Slaughter's gone. We need some sort of paramilitary we, guy. We need we need a serviceman. <laughs> Corporal Kirshner. I, you know, I thought he he did a better job when he hosted the rock concert, though, to be quite honest. No, that was Don Kirshner. Oh, uh, never mind. Corporal um, Kirshner. But Sarge at that point, he got big, he was big enough that he he could do indies and do his own schedule and merchandise. And then Vern at the time was. That's when Vern's business was kind of failing, so he would take any deal to get a star on television. So he said, hey, I'll just just do my TV. And so that way Sarge got more family time and, and blah, blah, blah. Sarge, you thought our schedule was easy in the early 80s. Now you just got to come to Vegas once a month. Yeah, and uh, there'll be no people there, but you'll be on television, on ESPN. And Billy Robinson will be working in a hotel, so you can go say hello to him. <laughs> But now here, here is the lies the problem that a lot of wrestlers wouldn't. Sarge had a unique opportunity there to be, you know, a star with GI Joe and national brand and blah blah blah. But a lot of guys would have been reticent to jump into that and to leave the spot with the biggest company in the world because of exactly what eventually happened in that Hasbro you know, decided to go in a different direction. It took like five yeah. or six years or whatever. When did that happen? Coincidentally enough. Uh, well, during the, the, when w before. when WWF got the Hasbro deal, because ah, they, well, they were with LJN okay. until 89 and 1990, they went with Hasbro. That's when Hasbro decided to move on from Sergeant Slaughter. Well, the point is that's what Vince, he said. How did Vince know? Vince called me up. I hear your, your uh, toy deals done. How did Vince oh, know yeah. that? <laughs> Cause he had Hasbro. But the point is, when you're off television, you know, after five years and Sarge being off TV, and now he's in his, what, mid-40s, and, you know, it's a start-over situation, you know, to because the, the, the big toy checks weren't coming. So Vince had him at a disadvantage, but he could put him back on television, and he pitched... WrestleMania seven with Hogan versus Sergeant Slaughter with Sarge as a heel. And that's when Vince gave him the, the line, we're going to do the LA Coliseum. We're going to draw a hundred thousand people. And of course, Sarge is, Oh my God, I could break all the records. I could be part of that. That's, you know, and that's where the, his wife said, you'll ruin all of our lives. 
So not but because of WrestleMania though, but because of the Iraqi sympathizer thing. Well, yes, but uh, yeah. anyway. And by the way, Vince screwed up because I was ten years old. I was the prime audience, and when Sergeant Slaughter came in, off years of GI Joe, that thing was on yeah. every morning on like Channel Eleven. G.I. Joe, the toys were everywhere, brought him in as a heel. I think it would have been bigger if they brought him in as a babyface, had him turn on Hogan. As cheesy as that is, as simple as that is, the longtime babyface that you've seen on TV and on toy shelves comes in as a friend of the top babyface. Yeah. And then one day just, you know, clotheslines him, the Orndorff. That would have been more effective than the Sarge sort of gives up on America. It, for a 10-year-old, it wasn't the way I wanted to see it, then it didn't. Not only did you know, it wasn't the way you want to see it, but you didn't really deep down believe it. Right. If it had if it had been if it had been more like a mega power state, which also uh, this uh, a lot of people don't give enough sunlight and highlight to the fact that this was Vince McMahon's biggest ever WrestleMania botch. If they had followed what they did with Hogan and Savage, with Hogan and Slaughter becoming a super team, GI Joe and Hulk Hogan, Real American. And then Slaughter turning on him for a personal issue. But Vince could not. Uh, now that in hindsight that I know him, I hadn't worked there then, but now that I know him, Vince could not control himself. He had the idea that, God damn it, this thing in Iraq is going on. And if he's if Sergeant Slaughter, an American hero, is a sympathizer and Hulk Hogan, my real American, can let, drop the leg on him and a blah, blah, blah. And he wasn't going to change it. As and Bruce tried to justify the whole thing as not being Vince's ever biggest ever WrestleMania botch. Well, it was art imitating life. Well, it was shitty art. Nobody, not only the I remember at the time this was the year that I was setting up Smoky Mountain Wrestling, but I was in and out of Memphis, and their business was the shits because the TV kept getting preempted for Gulf War shit. But it, it, people did not like this angle. They, Like you said, they didn't want to see and didn't believe Sergeant Slaughter suddenly shows up and in the corniest ways possible, vows allegiance to Saddam Hussein and General Adnan, and it's over the top. But the local sponsors didn't like it. The TV stations didn't like it. The WWF had to issue the statements, well, the views of Sergeant Slaughter do not represent ours or this station. And then Bruce wants to, or Bruce wants to, Vince wants to double down on it and put the belt on Sarge uh, over the warrior. And that's what Bruce said. Oh, shit. But uh, they still wouldn't give up on the thing when it, it, it was obvious that nobody liked it. They showed a column by Steve Beverly. He was writing a column for several newspapers at that point. The guy that did Matt Watch. and. Everybody was calling it tasteless. And I remember fans' reaction. They didn't like it. So then, that's where Sarge's wife said that Vince called her directly and, and told her, well, we've had some death threats. And they got him 24-7 security. And Sarge was loving it because he loved the heat. And then Bruce tries to bury Jesse Ventura for the idea they had to burn the American flag. Sarge wouldn't do it, but they burned Hogan's T-shirt. Yeah, that's weird for a couple of reasons. One, Jesse left in like August of 90. Yeah. So I got to look at the timeline and see if that makes sense. But the second thing is what Sergeant Slaughter did in 84, the end of 84, going to G.I. Joe, this was right when Jesse had the falling out with Vince because he signed his own video game deal with Sega. And Vince went crazy and said, you can't do it. And Jesse said, you know, the hell I can't. And Vince fired him, causing Jesse to sue him and win. So Jesse Ventura, another guy that tried to do his own deal, just like Sergeant Slaughter. But anyway, regardless of whose idea it was, Sarge wouldn't do that. But the whole thing, I'm writing at this point, he had an incredible career. And we're, we've spent over 30 minutes on a flop angle. and. So then Vince has to tell Sarge, well, we've canceled the Coliseum. We're moving indoors to the sports arena. And he blamed bomb threats. And it sure was a bomb. 
It, it was a threat of a bomb, all right, but not a bomb threat. They, they would have had the sports arena crowd in a 100,000-seat stadium. They admitted in this program that when they made the decision to move indoors in February for a late March show, they'd sold 12,000 tickets. And they didn't sell that many more, I don't think. Uh, they, they, they sold out at 16,000 but they were trying to do 100,000. And again, Bruce had to say, well, this has been known since it happened. The poor advance and the poor re reception that the angle got was being reported on and everything at the time, all the insider newsletters and a lot of the newspapers in general. That Bruce still says, well, there were several reasons. Now, ticket sales weren't going well, but the biggest reason was the cost of security. We didn't want somebody making a statement at our event in the L.A. Coliseum and a bomb. You know, and, and the cost of securing the Coliseum, it wouldn't have cost that much because they would have been able to shoot deer in the balcony because there wouldn't have been anybody in it. We could secure the arena easier. Of course you could. But if you had been able to sell 70,000 more tickets you probably would have been able to pay for the security guards. I think security would have had an easy job. There would have been so many empty sections of no one sitting anywhere. Yes. They would have been able to spot anything outrageous. But unless maybe as part of the pre-show security protocol, they were instructed to look under every empty seat. Now that could have taken a while. I swear, Bruce is like the fucking usher for the Vince McMahon library. <laughs> it's like taking you on a tour and just feeding you this bullshit you know, you could see why Ronda said he's Vince's avatar. Vince has him say what Vince would say and justify what Vince would justify. And Bruce comes across as completely disingenuous and just someone you wouldn't want around who's just slimy and, and dirty and just, I don't well, know. No, I'm, he's, I'll tell you what, he's meticulously clean as a person. As a human being, I'm not talking about in terms of the derma. I'm talking about the deep derma. inside. I'm talking deep inside the person. <laughs> well, deep down inside where the the derm is dermer. All right. Uh, but so then the region, the reason that Sarge did all this and turned on his country and and you know became an Iraqi sympathizer was to draw a hundred thousand people, and now he's at the LA Sports Arena doing drawing crowds. He's he's done that. And did that remind you of? In those days, thankfully, this has changed. They still do celebrities in the WWE, but all the cheesy celebrities at WrestleMania, you were reminded, even D-list, F-list, Z-list. Favors, no, because it had, and they even showed, I think, for a second, Regis, who's a pretty big star. He was on well, TV yeah. every day. Alex Trebek, beloved host of Jeopardy on TV every day. In between them, Marla Maples, famous oh, for yeah. having an affair with Donald Trump. Famous for fucking the most disreputable, repugnant human being on earth. You know, and I got to say one thing. Donald Trump is a trendsetter. When you see footage of WrestleMania 4 and 5 and here at 7, him sitting dead center right in the front row, he watches everything so you think he's interested, but he reacts to nothing. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't move. He doesn't clap. He doesn't... <laughs> it, like, you can tell he's watching. He's not falling asleep. But he re it's like a modern fan. I think he, he started the modern fan. <laughs> well, no, he's learning how to con the gullible suckers. <laughs> but anyway, so Sarge loses at WrestleMania to Hogan. Did the stiff boot to the face I'd never noticed before. But that's why he main evented WrestleMania. His wife didn't watch it. His daughters were scared that they'd hear that he'd been killed. And I again, I wrote, who was reinforcing this idea, I wonder? Because, yes, you hear, you know, everybody's war stories, but you don't see a lot of other heels kids crying about shit that happened 40 years ago. Uh, Is it, you know, well, let me ask you this. I mean, again, it's a different world now than the 50s or whatever in terms of smartening up your family. If a wrestler brings their family to a show, and one of the children has a reaction like that. Should the parents just come out and say, it's, you know, these are friends with your dad. They're not real. Don't worry. Nothing. You have nothing to worry about. Everything's okay. Or should they, you know, my God, what will he do next week? What will well, he no, do? It, 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 it depends on the kids and the age and the circumstance. And 
even if even if somebody has a real accident and is really hurt, the other parent should always be wanting to tell the kid, no, it's okay. He's going to be all right. Well, you know, he's a tough, whatever. Instead of, oh my God, his liver's falling out. But you didn't want to tell young children because they might be tempted if they're getting picked on in school to tell uh, the other kids, well, no, my dad could whip so-and-so. It's just that he's told not to or whatever the case. Uh, but, you know... <laughs> You have to tell that this is daddy's eye. What do boxers say? Or what do hockey players or football players? You have to say those kind of things. It's a, it's a professional sport. Your daddy's tough. He might be getting beat up, but he's going to beat the other guy up too. But, I mean, these people were traumatized. I think it was the, wife's, the way the wife was selling what was going on at the time. I'd have my kids sitting ringside every time they didn't do their chores. And just, I'd be, oh, God, oh. Just, yeah, see what's going to happen? All I needed you to do is take out the trash. Yeah, pick up the dog shit, and Daddy won't be getting kicked in the balls. <laughs> but anyway, um, so that's where we go to, you know, by the early 90s, he's becoming an agent. He was great to work with. He did appearances as an ambassador for the company, he did the commissioner stuff, and got to work through the Attitude Era with some of those guys and help them, and occasionally would get back in the ring and do a special match or take a couple bumps, and his, his shit still looked good. And at least his daughters like seeing him inducted in the Hall of Fame. And then it, right at the end of the program, they co covered the, the scandal or the blowback or whatever. He got heat for saying he was in the Marines when he wasn't in the Marines. And I guess on, what was it, the podcast, the Jim Norton asked him, well, yeah, I did two tours of Vietnam. Two tours, 68 to yeah. 74. But he said it wasn't Bob Remus, it was Sergeant Slaughter. But that's the thing. I it's served with a man named Manny Fernandez. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, but he apologizes, and he was working his gimmick, and he means it. He never wanted to just impersonate a service man or a law enforcement officer or some kind of official person for nefarious means it was a gimmick he came up with and the boys all told him and taught him you work your gimmick you tell people that you are real and did people go too far with that shit with the whole you know sergeant slaughter stolen valor he's stealing credit Ooh. he doesn't deserve it he's a uh... You know, people went crazy over this. Yeah, that's a. If you come out and you say, yeah, as a matter of fact, I got dropped from a helicopter, saved fucking four guys' lives, killed 18 Vietnamese people, and then fucking, uh, you know, prevented the battleship from sinking, I deserve a medal, and it's bullshit. I have 30 but, kills. Fuck, yeah, fuck you. But if it's just, if your gimmick is that you're, it was Jack Webb in the DI? Was he. Guilty of stolen valor because he was playing the thing on on the in the movie. He didn't break character in the movie. In wrestling, your movie is twenty four seven. That's you. We need more people with this dedication today. We wouldn't be in the bad shape we're in. But um, but I'm glad to see that he's hanging out a lot at his fish pond and still does fan fests and appearances. And uh, I wish he'd bring his memorabilia in the house and put it up on shelves where he can look at it. All right, well, there it is, the Sergeant Slaughter biography. I was impressed by the fact that he had all of his stuff, that he had everything from his collection. I'm a little distracted. I was looking for a promo here, Jim. Here's one of the early clues that Sergeant Slaughter may not have been in the military. Are you ready for this? Okay. Here's Dr. D. David Schultz. Coliseum Monday, June the 4th. Come on in, Dr. David Schultz, if you would, please notwithstanding the big match between the Iron Sheik and Sergeant Slaughter, you've got a crack at the former Marine prior to that out at the Cape Cod Coliseum. You know, I'd give anything in the world to get my hands on him before the Sheik got his hands on him. You're going to do it. Because after the Sheik gets his hands on you, boy, or after I get my hands on you, ain't nobody going to want you anymore. We're going to make mince meat out of you, boy. We're going to make dog meat out of you. We're going to beat you up so bad. And you're talking about combat boots in Vietnam. I never seen a soldier in my life while I was in <laughs> Vietnam wear steel toed combat boots, you idiot. <laughs> it rains a lot there. You're a goof. You ain't got everything upstairs. But Cape Cod, 
wherever that is. Oh. I'll get there. You know, I've got a good friend. Of, friend of mine who lives out there. I don't care if your whole family what? lives there. I don't Where care if your I... mama lives there. I don't care if your daddy and your mama lives there together. I don't care if your mama lives with another man there. I want Sergeant Slaughter there. And I don't care if you bring your mama with you, Sergeant Slaughter. I'll slap her like a dog. <laughs> and I don't care if you bring your daddy. I'll beat him like a dog. Now, see, I just don't care. You know what I mean? I believe there's an now attitude problem bring your problem family there, with yes. you. I believe you've got the problem. I don't have You any. look like you got a problem. You're I... getting thin on the head. You're ugly. I don't like you. you got a bad, uh, what you call it, manners. You and Sarge might be kin. You both might be from Cape Cod. So just bring the whole family and line them up, because I'd like to slap about 15 or 20 of them plum silly I... after I get through with you, Sergeant Slaughter. Thank you very much, Dr. David Schultz, outspoken. You're welcome. Well, there it is, Jim, but steel toe boots in Vietnam. It rains a lot there. <laughs> it rains a lot over there. <laughs> Oh, and that's actually, that's a, a, a good look at uh, what it's like to talk to David Schultz also. That's a local promo. That was a local promo for TV, and it was amazing. Trying to slap Sergeant Slaughter's mom and dad. <laughs> but, but you know what? They needed some writers. They needed some writers. Oh, come on. Well, how's anybody going to believe it without writers? Well, there it is. Sergeant Slaughter. I thought it was a very, very well done documentary. I could see... Maybe not to the degree that you feel it, why you feel what you feel about the wife, and uh, someone should have just talked to the kid and said, calm down, he'll be home for supper. Yeah. But uh, a good documentary there. Jim, before we go to the next thing we have to talk about, I think what we need to talk about is a good meal. A good meal! Well, have you got any suggestions? You gonna take me out to a restaurant? You gonna spend a lot of money? To pay a chef to fix up some meal for me and serve it to me, nice and hot and ready to eat? How much is that going to cost you, Brian? Well, That's going to cost you a fortune. It and would, it, but I'm not going to do those things. Well, and how do I know that these meals are approved by a dietitian and I'm getting all of my, my vegetables and my minerals and my, my calories and all the things that I'm supposed to get in the proper uh, portions per day? How do, how, do we, how do we factor all that in? That's going to cost a fortune, isn't it? It won't cost a fortune with factor. Well, that's because we're factoring these things in. Folks, if you'd like to factor yourself into some delicious restaurant-quality meals that are ready to heat and eat whenever you are and wherever you are, well, then you need to go to the folks at Factor Meals. That's what we've been doing because, you know, in this... Hurry, scurry world. The hustle and bustle of modern society. Brian, how often do you have time to shop and prepare and cook and eat and then clean up after the meals over and over again? While I, you're out busy earning a living for you and the children. I don't have any time. I wish I had time to cook for everyone, but I don't have the time. No, and your wife doesn't have the time because she's busy caring for all those children that you have. And the children. They don't have the time because the last time they tried to cook dinner, it burned the last manor to the ground. It's not so true. If you're if you're not going to let these these underage uh, miners operate heavy equipment and potentially use kerosene and be involved in flames and fires and noxious gases, then your wife and you out there in in podcast land, you're so busy earning a living with your various jobs and enterprises that you just don't have time to do the shopping and the cooking and the eating and the preparing and the cleaning and all that stuff. Factor is going to fix it for you. No prep, no mess meals, ready to heat and eat. Now you can put them in the microwave or you can put them in the oven or you can hold them over a campfire. As a matter of fact, I don't even care if you run, run a candle underneath them a couple of times because you like your meat rare. The meals are fixed right up for you. And they're ready to go in just two minutes. You got 35 different options to choose from every week. Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, Keto. The, as a matter of fact, here's some of the ones that we got here at Castle Cornet. I've got this documentation right here. We got the roasted garlic chicken with green beans and sour cream and onion mashed potatoes. It's right there in the container you just heat it up red pepper queso chicken with brown rice parmesan 
and sun-dried tomato chicken penny with roasted green beans and pearl onions. <laughs> what are you laughing at? It's no, no, penny, not penny. Penny, that's what it says, penny. <laughs> tomato, sun-dried tomato chicken penny with roasted green beans and pearl onions. Pearl, 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 don't give your love to Earl. I can give you diamond rings. I can give you fancy things. I'm telling you, folks, at Factor, you're going to get food that, well, anybody would eat if you stuck it in front of them. And there's more than Anyone 60... would eat if they could pick good, wonderful, chef-crafted food without having the chef-crafted prices. Yes, because if you go out to a place and have this, the chef craft these recipes and the Crap. dietitian approve them, Crap. that's what I said. Yeah. Well, it would cost you a fortune, but if you use Factor Meals and their chef who's crafting these things and their dietitian, he's a guy named Phil. He's a heck of a fella. Phil. Phil. Phil the dietitian. Well, then then they're gonna they're gonna package everything up and send it right to your door. You don't have to go out in public. You don't have to risk getting ill or killed in a car wreck or robbed or shot in this country. It's gonna come right to your door. You heat it up when you want it. They got the add-ons, pancakes, smoothies, easy options for the entire day, midday bites, breakfast, all kinds of stuff. So if you're looking for fast premium options with no cooking required, just heating, they will do the rest. And it's less expensive than takeout and or going and actually getting it on the premises. And it's nutritious and delicious. Go to factormeals.com slash JCE50 and use the code JCE50. You're going to get 50% off. So you're trying this stuff. At half price. I mean, for heaven's sake, if you don't like it, feed it to the dog. If you're getting it for half price, you're down to the fucking price of Alpo anyway, aren't you? So just try it and see what happens. Factormeals.com slash JCE50 and get 50% off. It's half price. You can literally get some of this sun-dried tomato chicken penny well, you're only going to pay for half of it. That's right. Penny, you're only like pay Mercedes a Monet, not Mercedes Money. You're going to pay a penny for the chicken penny. <laughs> no, every time you eat some of this, you're only paying for half of it. Keep that in mind. Factormeals.com. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Yes, factormeals.com. What's that promo code, Jim? JCE50. 